not specifically in the Bible as portal, although I am quoting 2 Corinthians 12.10 from the Passion Translation, and Brian Simmons uses that word of portal, but you might hear some folks say, well, it's not really in the Greek or whatever. Well, look, open heaven over our lives. Remember the ladder that appeared, opened up over heaven? That's a portal. That's, a, that's an open place between heaven and earth. And we are portals of God's power. I think you need to say it again. We're in this year of declaration. I am a portal of God's power. And there's a choice here that we have to make. Um, I, I love, you know, being where David was when we were over there. Again, having been a uh, worship leader all these years and studying the life of David, that really came alive when he was on the run from Saul. We were in the place where he was hiding in the caves. And then there was a spring called En Gedi in the middle of desolate desert, right, where he was hiding. There's this waterfall coming out of the desert. And you've heard the analogy probably, would you rather be a cistern or a spring? right and very clearly you want to be the spring because that's being fed from underground that's right in psalm 1 right blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly but his delight is in the law of the lord he will be like a tree what planted by the cistern see how silly that sounds no be like the tree planted by the river of living water and he will bring forth fruit at a season because he's always being fed or she's always being fed from this underground spring a cistern you have to keep filling up and it dries out or sometimes they crack and then they leak and as an example of the kind of portal we want to be we don't want to be a portal that has to keep getting filled up we want to be fed from the underground springs which is the holy spirit right so i'm going to talk about this idea of portal you can be a portal of god's power or if your life is an open portal and the enemy gets in then his power can operate in you too and it's only one or the other there's not like a neutral ground here. So I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying this is, the, this is the reality of our lives, that if you're not moving forward, you're going backwards. Not a neutral in the Lord. So we want to keep that edge. We want to keep growing. We want to keep hungry for the Lord. And I know everybody shared the same sentiment. We're digging into the word deeper, having been there now, because it just comes so alive to you. So let's just look at this second corinthians 10 it says when i'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for christ i am made yet stronger now that sounds like a contradiction doesn't it how could you be made stronger when you're facing persecution if you're an athlete you understand the idea of no pain <laughs> no gain so like the coach is pushing you to keep going and you don't think you have anything left in you, and yet you get stronger by pushing through that difficult thing that you were facing, right? And we sing that song, when it looks like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. Oh, you have to still remember that, because the enemy wants to get you to think, just give up and quit. So that's what Paul's saying, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I'm going to say parenthetically, I have a choice. I can either be made stronger or I can open myself up to what the enemy wants to do and quit. But I'm going to choose to be made stronger for my weakness becomes a portal for God's power. I can sit back and say, you know what, Lord, I'm nothing in my own strength, but you can come in now and take over from me. So that's really encouraging to me. I kind of analogize it to my cell phone. Anybody else ever forget to charge your phone? I'm sure everybody in here has. And you watch that, that number going down and down and down. And you ever have it where the number goes down faster than usual? Because like you must have a bunch of apps open that are draining a lot of your battery. And then you go online and you find out how to save your battery. And like I'm no expert on all this stuff. But that's how the Lord showed it to me. Is we all go through seasons where the battery charges low. And he is the one that recharges us if we choose to turn to him. Right? You remember that little Four Spiritual Laws booklet that was, uh, that's just billions of them have been given out by Campus Crusade for Christ and Bill Bright. And they drew that picture and they say, there's two choices. You can have yourself on the throne or you can have Jesus on the throne of your heart. And that's kind of what this comparison's like. If you are in that moment where it feels overwhelming to you and you're vulnerable because you don't know what to do, that's a form of weakness. But when you turn to God, you're putting Jesus on the throne, and all of a sudden that dying battery gets recharged because you need power. 
And when I'm sitting on the throne, that power drains off way too fast because I'm taking matters into my own hands. And God loves us enough to let you do that because he wants to show you, no, you don't have to do that. But when you do, things don't end well. I want you to depend on me. And man, even in the times that I don't know what to do, when I'm feeling weak, I can be a portal to let him come in and charge my battery as opposed to him <laughs> sitting off on the sideline and watching me drain my battery because I tried to take charge. And then you end up having to recover from so many mistakes that you make when you do that. All right, so um, in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, it says, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like what? Now, does that sound like a compliment or an insult? <laughs> Probably most people would say, I'm not fragile. But it's not the point he's trying to make. He wants us to know that compared to the glory that God has in us, we are fragile. Because depending on who's on the throne of your heart, you can either hold that glory or the glory leaves because you're, in, you're on the throne of your heart. And God has to say, OK, I'll watch while your cistern just drains. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted you to be connected to the springs. But if you're going to try to take charge and do it yourself, then I'm just going to have to sit back and watch. So it's not an insult at all. It's there to remind us, you know, fragile. If you said a vase was fragile, that wouldn't be an insult. It means it's delicate. It means it's a fine piece of china, let's say. It's not a negative. It just says, be careful. Handle it with care. And we're, we're jars of clay. But what's inside of us, it's so great, containing this great treasure. There's a light shining in our hearts, and we're like a fragile clay jar that contains this great treasure. And here's the point, again, Paul writing, it makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. So what's the great temptation that Satan tries to put on us is pride, right? And, and sometimes the more Christian you become and the more you read, the more pride creeps in. And it's back to us sitting on the throne again and not staying humble and not allowing those things that I don't always know what to do. We, we have to know what to do because knowing what to do is what a strong Christian means. Well, no, you're supposed to stay pliable in his hands. And when you come across a situation where you don't feel you have the goods, you just stop and say, Lord, I need your help right now. 24-7. This could be in any situation in your life. You just pause and say, I need help. I, I'm, I'm stuck on this one. I need you to come in here and recharge my battery right now. Lord, I'm getting off the throne. Or you could think of a pilot and a co-pilot. <laughs> I'm just handing the controls over to you. That's not a sign of weakness. You're not bothering God. Or you're not less than because you didn't know what to do. He's trying to show you on a daily basis. Situations are not structured the same way. Each situation is different, and you need the fresh anointing of the Lord to show you what to do. That power inside us is not from us. It's from the Lord. Amen? So... Think about some of the people who had the power of God in the Old and the New Testament. Think of King David, amazing man of God, held up to us as an example, as a man after God's own heart. The great king, Jesus the Messiah, was going to have to come through the line of David. So what much, how much higher of a compliment could you get? And yet he had a besetting sin in his life. He couldn't control his sexual appetite. And appetites take a lot of different forms, but that's been one of the devil's main ones that he's used on people for all these centuries, right? Is not being able to control a sexual appetite. Now, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is called temperance. Love, joy, peace, they're all great. But you know what? Temperance is a really good one. Because in the Old Testament, it says, if you don't rule your spirit, you're like a city with the wall broken down. That means the enemy can just come in and attack you. So all these ways David is controlling and, and ruling his spirit. He's writing psalms. He's engaging with the Lord. He gets a promise from God that your son is going to be the, the king. And God wasn't talking about Solomon. He was talking about Jesus. What a promise. And yet tapped into the cistern instead of the spring. There was a root issue in his life that he never dealt with, and I don't want him to correct me when I get to heaven, so I'm not going to go too far off. But when he fell into sin with Bathsheba, it wasn't just his life that took a, a downturn. The whole nation took a downturn, right? Because Solomon, he, he way outdid his father 
with all those porcupines and concubines and, and wives and all of these relationships he made with these foreign nations. He opened the whole country up to idolatry. And yet he was the smartest man in the world. And yet he was still victim spiritually to being subject to the cistern instead of the springs. He, in, his, in his logic and his wisdom, he counted too much, Solomon did, in his wisdom. Even though the anointing was there, when they dedicated the temple, the, the anointing was so strong the priests couldn't even stand to minister. So it's not binary. It's not like you're either all in or you're all out. We're all working in areas where we're very mature in some areas, but then there's other areas that we have a weakness and a vulnerability. And God's saying, in that weakness and vulnerability, that's my opportunity to come into your life. You could be a portal of my power. You don't have to give in to that cistern. Stay tapped into my springs. But you need to be humble to do that because that means you have to admit you don't have it all together. And if the religious system you're in is telling you you have to keep it all together and you can't admit that you're dealing with a problem, you're stuck. You're in a bad spot. Well, I've said it enough times here, but I'm going to say it again. We want an honest culture where we can be healthy with each other. The Holy Spirit's called the spirit of truth. If we can't speak truth to each other about the stuff that we're dealing with and the problems that we have, where are you going to speak about this? It's got to be in church. You've got to feel safe in church to be able to talk to somebody and say, I need help. And, you know, we're going to say, well, have you read the word? And if you say no, well, you're gonna, then we're going to have to say, well, why not? If you need help, there's your place to go. Start there. Doesn't mean we won't help you. But this isn't a hospital where we're just going to start injecting you. You're going to have to do some of the work yourself. We can't do it for you. We can help you on the way. But, you know, from all the years of experience, you, you could be enabling somebody to stay in the cistern. We all have to take ownership of our own walk with God. Amen? So your choice, um, I, I don't want to ramble, <laughs> but there's a couple of things that he showed me that I really want to talk about. So it's not just David and not just Solomon. I could have used Samson as another analogy of a, of a mighty leader who had a besetting sin of not controlling his sexual appetite. See a little theme going here? I mean, the Spirit of the Lord came on Samson. He did great miracles. And yet, this besetting sin was enough to derail him and, and cause his death. Right? And then you look in the New Testament, and you can compare Peter and Judas as a quick example. Judas was one of the 12. Right? That, that wasn't by accident. He started out good, but then the, the enemy was able to enter his heart and to the point where he would turn in Jesus and then commit suicide. Peter was a flawed man. That's obvious from reading the New Testament. But yet when you see him in the New Testament, instead of feeling condemned where he had to kill himself, he got convicted and he allowed the Holy Spirit to come in and touch his life and recognize, even though I made mistakes, I did not disqualify myself. And none of us here should ever feel disqualified from serving the Lord, no matter how bad the mistake was that we made. It doesn't mean we don't have to repent. And if you need repentance, look at Psalm 51. Because David realized the weightiness of the sin. It wasn't just against other people. And that's what he says right in there. Against you alone, Lord, did I sin. You trusted me with the whole nation. And it's against you that I sinned. Because you trusted me and I let you down on that. But he repented, right? And, and God did not erase him from the record. We just want to live in a place where we're on our front toes, alerting the Lord, recognizing where pride's trying to creep in and, and tell you, you don't need to ask God for help on this one. And God's saying, no, when you need help, that's a portal to my power. You become a portal to my power to come in, and you let me take over. And this is Holy Spirit driven because you keep inviting him in every morning. You invite Holy Spirit in and say, I don't want the controls today. I want to listen to the Lord. He's the pilot. I'm just the co-pilot, right? But man, in our culture, it's just so easy to take the controls back and try to do it yourself. So we'll talk about Peter for a minute. And in Acts chapter 4, this is one of those places where if you compare the Old and the New Testament, you're just looking at Peter going, dude, you just, you just had a 180. You went from being a guy who was afraid to talk to this little servant girl the night before the crucifixion to now being a leader in the church, and it's the fourth chapter of Acts. Anybody remember what happened in the third chapter of Acts? It says Peter and John were on the way to the temple at the time of prayer, and they met somebody. Who did they meet outside the temple? 
the beggar. He had been there his whole life, right? And all of a sudden, Peter says, look at me. <laughs> and it says the beggar looks at him thinking that they're going to give him money. And Peter says, no, silver and gold I, I don't have. But what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise and be healed. And this is a guy that everybody in the whole country knew had been a beggar there his whole life. And all of a sudden, he's running around, jumping up and down. And the religious people, who were still drinking from the cistern, because they wouldn't tap into the, to the springs of living water, said, oh, well, you know, how did he do this? Oh, well, we don't know. This is a, a similar story, right? What did, what did you do? How did he do this to you? And the blind guy in the, in the other example said, I don't know. I just know that when I left the house this morning, I was blind, and now I can see. <laughs> Why don't you just ask him yourself? <laughs> But there was a similar problem with the beggar because they go and arrest Peter. What, what was the crime for healing somebody? And then they confront him. And I'm jumping. I'm sorry. I'm racing a little fast here. But you know the Bible well enough. You can read it. <laughs> In Acts chapter 10, he's lecturing the Pharisees. Now, look, Peter was not an educated guy, right? So what? is he doing lecturing the Pharisees about what just happened? It shows the supernatural power of God. In his weakness, meaning like he didn't have the formal education, he could have been so intimidated standing in front of these people, he says, no, look, this man was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. There's salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And the members of the council were what? I think there's probably a bunch of words you could put in there <laughs> besides amazed. I think perplexed would be in there. Who is this guy? They could tell from his accent that he was not from Jerusalem and that he was more of a hillbilly. That's what Peter Wagner used to call the fishermen from Galilee would have been looked at as, remember Jethro on the Beverly Hillbillies? The cement pond? <laughs> that was the swimming pool. And there's this ranking that we do with people. And when we hear that they don't speak like we do, we think they're less than. And then God all of a sudden says, no, I could speak through anything and anybody. And you don't have the right to judge them and think of them as less than. And that's why these guys are amazed because their paradigm had to shift. Like all of a sudden God's using somebody that doesn't look qualified. Anybody here in that boat? Raise your hand. <laughs> All of us are in that boat. The members were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were what? Can you see it? Ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. And they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Man, if we could just camp there for a minute and just recognize that you can't try to live up to the expectations of everybody that you know. There's always going to be something that they're going to say that you fall short in. And there's going to be a temptation to try to become something that you're not. If Peter had tried to be eloquent like the Pharisees here, he would have sold himself out. He would have still been drinking from the cistern. But once the Holy Spirit came in, he convicted Peter that you could just be who God made you to be, Peter. You don't have to be a Pharisee. You don't have to try to speak like them. I've given you everything you need if you're just willing to be who I called you to be. And those times that you're not sure what to do, I'll be a portal into your life. In that place of weakness, I'll come in in my power, and you'll go from the phone dying. I hate when I see that red battery, you know, like, you know you're getting close. It goes from red to the red of Jesus, boom, 100%. Charged. We need power. And the cistern, man, that drains real quick. Stay connected to Holy Spirit, amen? All right, so is it making sense? All right, because this is one of those moments that I had while we were in Israel. It happened early in the trip. Um, we, we started out um, near Caesarea, and I had read about Caesarea, but I didn't really study it. I didn't know anything much about the city, but I am Italian, and I knew there was a guy named Cornelius from the Italian band. Now, I think he probably played guitar because that's the best instrument God loves the most, but he had another kind of band. He was in, in a Roman centurion, which meant he had 100 men working for him, right? So I remembered the story of Peter being told that he was going to have to go 
with these people that weren't Jews, right? Remember when he had the open vision? And I'll talk about it a little bit here. But I didn't know when he went to Cornelius' house what that meant. I just thought he was going to Cornelius' house. So, you know, you're on the tour, you're over in Israel, everybody's all excited and you're happy and you don't really know what to expect. And we show up and they say, this is Caesarea. And like, okay, that's cool. And then it hits me. Like, this wasn't just a town. This was where Herod the Great, you know, the really, like, crazy guy. He had the three sons who were even crazier than him. But Herod was the one that wanted to kill the babies, right? Like, just crazy. He was a master architect. And we went to several things that he built there, and it was off the charts. Brilliant how he built them. Guess how he built them? Slave labor. Okay? Everybody the Romans captured then became a, a, a stonemason and all the things that Herod wanted to build. So this was not just some little city. This was the palace that Herod used when he was in Israel. This is where Pontius Pilate stayed. It was on the coast. It was elaborate beyond what you could even imagine. There's still remnants of the swimming pool right on the Mediterranean that he had built. You could still see the tile that was there, but there was this whole big palace and infrastructure so that when the Romans came from Rome to Israel, they got a taste of Rome, which I would say is opulence beyond, like decadence, because they were constantly flashing the card, we're your boss. These are my relatives, by the way, <laughs> right? We rule with an iron thumb, and what we think is normal, you will never achieve. You'll never have enough money to live like we live, and you're only alive because I haven't chosen to kill you. So be happy you're a slave. Who does that sound like? The devil. They ruled with an iron fist. They crucified you at the drop of a hat just to, to get everybody else to realize you can't mess around with them. You can't go against them. So Peter, who's this fisherman, unsophisticated fisherman, well, might as well just read it, right? Acts chapter 10. Start with Cornelius first, my cousin. <laughs> I haven't found him yet on uh, the DNA search online on Ancestry.com. I'm still looking for Cornelius. Doesn't even sound like an Italian name, but they did things different then. At that time, there was a Roman military officer, Cornelius, who was in charge of 100 men stationed in Caesarea. OK, again, that didn't mean anything to me until I got to the city. When I saw the size of the palace, and I saw how different that was than everything else. You know, you're driving through miles of just desert and no life, and all of a sudden you come upon this opulent city right on the Mediterranean. It's like total culture shock, difference. So that's where he was stationed. One afternoon at 3 o'clock, he had an open vision and saw the angel of God appear right in front of him, calling out his name, Cornelius. And the angel told him, send some men to Joppa at once. Have them find a man named Simon the Rock. And Cornelius called for two of his servants and a trusted what? A trusted godly soldier. How rare do you think a Roman would be called a trusted godly soldier? <laughs> right? But this man Cornelius was a believer. So one of his men was a believer, at least one. Now, if you're a regular citizen in J Jerusalem or any of the cities and you see a Roman soldier come by, you're paying attention because you do not want him talking to you because they represent Rome. You don't mess with that guy. You think a state trooper's bad, Roman soldier would be much worse, okay? Here's this heathen guy in the palace of Rome that's in Israel. He's praying to God and an angel appears to him. Like, what are the odds of that? In the midst of the belly of the beast, there was a godly man there that's calling out to God and, and the angel says, God's heard your prayers. Call for this man named Simon. So he sends two of his servants and a soldier. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I know. Wow, it hit me. A little bit later in the chapter, Peter was up on the roof at the time of prayer. The vision comes. I'm not going to go through all that. You probably know what happened. But it says in verse 19, as he was deep in thought, trying to interpret the vision, the spirit said to him, go downstairs now, for three men are looking for you. Don't hesitate to go with them, because I have sent them. So, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I haven't known what's going on most of the time, but I'm serving God, so I'm going to be obedient because I know it's the voice of the Lord. He goes downstairs, and one of the three guys is a Roman soldier. This is not user-friendly. 
this would really put a big fear in you. When you see the lights go on behind you on the highway, you're not thinking good thoughts, are you? You're hoping, hope it's not me. Hope it's somebody else he's going to pull over. Those, whatever that is in your body that kicks in is really kicking in. Like, oh no, I don't need another impre premium increase <laughs> on my insurance. Please pass me by, <laughs> state trooper. <laughs> so he did go. Peter was obedient. And where is he going? Like I said, he's walking into the belly of the beast. He's going to Caesarea, which is where the palace is. And, you know, one of the other things that you notice when you're in Israel even today is the difference between those that have and those that don't have because the ones that don't have really don't have i mean it's very obvious and I'm not going to go off on that trail but it was even worse in the time of jesus okay because the romans constantly flexed their muscles of their power and they kept the people reminding the people that you are slaves which is exactly what the devil wants to do so here's peter now a fisherman not very qualified to speak inside the palace of caesarea and he walks in with them, and, and in verse 25 says, the moment Peter walked in the door, this centurion, Cornelius, who's got a hundred men under him, falls down at his feet, that's what it says, to worship him. Talk about Peter thinking, what did I just step into? I have no idea why I'm here, but I'm thinking I'm in trouble. But he walks in, and the leader falls at his feet to worship him. And Peter says, wait a minute. He pulls him up to his feet and says, stand up, for I'm only a man and no different from you. Think of the humility there. Because if Peter was still dealing with his insecurities of what happened in the Gospels about denying Christ, when this guy fell down at his feet, he might have been tempted to let him stay there a little while. I'm liking this worship thing. That's the cistern. See, that's you on the throne. But the spring is saying, no, no, that's the wrong spirit. That's not what we're trying to convey to people. That's not who God is in you, Peter. That had to be all stripped down off of him. All that pride, all that junk. Anybody here need that? Yes, we do. So it's not negative if he says, you're a portal to my power in your weakness. Weakness is not a negative there. Because none of us are going to score 10 out of 10 on every single thing in life. Sorry to break the news. We all need help in something. And that's where he wants us to live, in that position, that posture of needing help. How am I doing on time? Pretty good. OK. And then this hit me. Sorry, 34. Peter looks at this guy in this situation. And he says, now I know for certain that God doesn't show favoritism with people, but treats everyone on the same basis. <laughs> now, I always thought, prior to going to Israel, that Peter's looking and going, God, wow, you would even save a soldier in the Roman army, a leader in the Roman army. Like, everybody is able to come into the kingdom, right? That was how I always heard it taught, and that's true, that God's no respecter of persons, drug addict to politician to Wall Street banker. Everybody's eligible to be saved. But I also now think Peter was saying, you're using me. You're no respecter of persons. Like, I'm the least likely person to be standing in this palace talking to the centurion and him falling at my feet to worship me. Oh, my God, you can use anybody. And that was me thinking, wow, who am I to, to tell God no? Right? I mean, if you know it's his voice. Your qualifications isn't what got him to tell you to do it, right? It's that you, his spirit is living on the inside of you. So if he calls you, he anoints you because he appointed you. That was the title of a book, Called, Anointed, and Appointed. Yeah, that's you and me. Are we tracking? I'm trying to pack so much into a little bit of time here. I, I just don't know if I lose people sometimes. Good. Happy to hear that. <laughs> Sounds good. 11-hour flight coming back, red eye. This is a difficult portion of scripture that I'm going to read, but I want to do it. I want to tackle it because we don't talk about it enough. And um, some, uh, you know, depending on the different parts of the body of Christ, people have different explanations for this. So just pull that little handout that I put in your bulletin for a minute. 
I'll tell you why I gave it to you. And this is just a partial listing of scriptures on healing. That's a front and back, right? So this is partial. There's plenty more I could have given you. So do me a favor and don't read them right now. But just hold them. I, I trust you're mature enough. Just like I've got dozens of scripture in my hands about God wanting to heal us. Do you believe that? It's God's will to heal you. He doesn't use sickness to try to teach you a lesson. If he did that, we could call Dyphus, and we could report him as a, as a bad father. He doesn't use sickness to try to teach us a lesson. He loves us. He comes to give us life more abundantly. Sickness is not abundant life. Somebody else needs some handouts over here on this side, Rich. Going once, going twice. Yeah, I'll just give it a second. Now, I'll just back up on Corinthians for a minute. The town of Corinth, we didn't get to go there, but it was a big port city as well. Caesarea was a big port city, lots of traffic. And Corinth was not filled with a lot of people that knew the Bible, so they were kind of a secular church. And you read 1 Corinthians, and he's given them a lot of guidance about basic things. Then you get to 2 Corinthians, and he's taking on a challenge. Now, remember, Paul was an apostle. And apostles would go to places and they would get people saved and they would start a church and they'd raise up leaders and then he would leave and go to another town and he'd go to the toughest place he'd go into the synagogue he got stoned to death one time remember that and they raised him from the dead and he went back so I wasn't finished <laughs> this is a tough dude so now this is 2nd Corinthians and we're up to chapter 12 but if you go back to 9 10 and 11 he's recognizing that they're starting to listen to some false teachers. And those false teachers are trying to say, Paul is too rigid. It's, it's, it's more about the way you speak and the eloquence of speech. And he's not a good speaker. He writes to you the letters, but he's not impressive in person. You remember this? I don't have to go back over that with you, right? But he's like a dad. And he's writing to these Corinthians as children and saying, be careful, you're about to be deceived. And it's really easy to be deceived. And, and that was one of the downsides of being an apostle who kept on traveling. You couldn't stay there and nurture those people as long as you might have liked to. So he would go back and he would write letters, but he had a mission, right? So this was almost in a way bound to happen in some way that false teachers are going to try to tickle your ears. And they were really getting to the Corinthians because they weren't real grounded yet in the word. And they were given to, uh, what's the right word, kind of emotional things as opposed to Paul's grounding in the word. So that's a little bit of a setup. And as he's writing, this is the chapter where he says, look, if I wanted to pull rank and talk about my experiences, I could. But I haven't done that because that's pride. And that's the thing I want to tackle here for a minute. It says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven, and he heard things which cannot be told, which man may not utter. So now he's not bragging. Remember, he's only telling them, if you're thinking these guys are going to convince you through experiences, I've had experiences. I just haven't held that up to you because that's not what you should be chasing. You want the presence of God. And when you have the presence, you will have experiences. But we can't be looking like pinball machines to get the next experience. It's like, give me another fix. No. Stay grounded in the word, pray in tongues, pray to the Lord, study the word. And as you go about on your mission every day, you're going to get great experiences with God. You're going to see people's lives change. So to keep me in verse 7, this is what people have such a hard time with. Verse 7 says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. All right? There's a lot of different versions here, but conceited is a good word. How would God giving you sickness stop you from, come, from becoming conceited? It doesn't even fit. It's not going to make you less prideful to be sick, but that's what some people have taken it, because a thorn in the flesh at a surface level, one of the words of that thorn could mean a sickness. So they've taken it to mean God had to teach me a lesson, so he gave me sickness to teach me a lesson. Can I just tell you, that is not what we believe. If you're up here for prayer, you're not going to hear our team say, 
God, if it's your will, heal this person. Okay? We believe it's God's will to heal you. Okay? I can't answer why it doesn't happen every time. All right? Maybe that's partly our fault. For we don't have enough faith. I do know that we're going to keep praying, though. And we're going to keep fasting and believing God for signs, wonders, and miracles. When that stops happening, let's just go to a different church where it is happening. Okay? Because we're not here to play church. We're here to see lives changed and transformed by his power. So you have to be really careful when you read something like this that you don't misinterpret it, and that's why I gave you this handout. How could you read two front and back of the, the pages of notes on all the scriptures of healing and think that he would do that to us? And I'll, I'll, again, without trying to editorialize too much, if you've been praying for somebody and they're not getting healed, you might start to think he just doesn't do that anymore. So maybe he did it to Paul to keep him humble. He kept him sick so he couldn't brag. No, that's not what I believe happened. And that's not even the interpretation of Calvin and, and Luther and some of the early real brilliant interpreters of the Bible. This word was taken as temptation. The, the, the devil was harassing Paul with temptations. That's what it says. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said what? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. You see that connects to what we said? In my weakness, I'm a portal for God's power. So when that enemy is harassing me, and look, the enemy is like an accusing attorney. So what could he bring up? What kind of evidence could Paul bring up, could the enemy bring up about Paul to harass him? Who do you think you are? You're the one that watched Stephen being stoned, and you approved of You're a murderer. So who makes you think that you should be a leader in the church? Has that ever happened to any of you? What do you do with that voice? Take it captive. Two chapters before, 2 Corinthians 10, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is the spiritual warfare that goes on. And if you don't take it captive, you start giving place to that thing and you start thinking less of yourself. I have disqualified. You could say, you know, I really have disqualified myself. I did stand by and watch Stephen when he was being murdered. No, that's a lie. That was the old you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. That person died and I've been resurrected. Doesn't mean I don't make mistakes on this side, but when I make a mistake on this side, I know how to repent. I didn't know how to repent back then. That's the difference, isn't it? Big difference. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That's a very hard thing to understand. In our culture, nobody says power is made perfect in weakness. What my culture on Wall Street would say is power is made perfect by working harder and getting more degrees, and talking bad about other people, and, and just uh, find, an, find somebody who's competing against you and trash them. And, and hold, no holds barred. Anything goes. It's all fair in love and war. And business is war, and you do whatever you have to do. I'm telling you, this is like a really wicked spirit. It's what we have to compete in every day. And yet you can compete and, and prosper because you're a Christian because you don't do that. That's how we should all be looking at this thing. I don't have to sink to their level. That's what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek. They're expecting you to slap back. But if you don't slap back, they don't know what to do because you're going to love them. And you're going to get better sales numbers because you're honest about your sales. It may take a little while longer. But you do it my way, you're going to prosper. That takes a little courage to do that, doesn't it? It's really easy to just go with the flow and just do what, what the rest of them are doing. But, you know, nine times out of ten, they're watching you and they get more respect for you. They won't admit it publicly, but one-on-one, -on -one, when they need prayer, they'll come and talk to you. They do. Let's go to the next one. I'm just... Paul, again, just contradicts our, our thinking, and he actually says to the Corinthians, I'm actually going to celebrate my weaknesses. <laughs> Anybody else have a hard time with that one? 
when you read it, like, what do you mean you're going to say? That's so contrary to the American culture. We hide our weaknesses. Everywhere you look, nobody wants to admit weaknesses because it's such a stigma in our culture. For when I'm weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. And that's a mature approach, don't you think? You don't have to, you can always see the glass half empty or half full. I fell short in this area, but instead of seeing that as a weakness, I'm going to see it as a portal for God's power coming into my life to grow me even deeper and grow me even stronger. So I'm not defeated by my weakness, as Paul said, but I'm delighted. For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, this is what I started with, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I'm made yet stronger. For my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. I'm going to end now, okay? Because that's a lot to chew on. And I've been chewing on it, so hopefully it's a good meal for you too. Because, you know, I'm, I've always admired Paul. He was one of those people that worked and ministered at the same time. He was a marketplace minister to the max. And there was no drop off in his anointing because he still stayed in the workforce. There was a certain reality check that that brought into his life about dealing with the lost because he was with the lost all the time. And as Christians, I don't think we're supposed to spend 100% of our time with other Christians. <laughs> Nothing against other Christians. We're family. We need each other. But if you only ever spend time with other Christians and watching Christian TV, how do you relate to the lost? Pretty hard. You can lose your love for them. And God says, I don't want one of them to perish. So anyway, that's a different message, but he didn't do that. Paul didn't lose that. So I'm just going to take one of these classic portions of scripture and chew on it as, as we finish here today. Because this was not meant to be condemning and me calling you weak and thinking that weakness is, you know, the world's term of weak. No. Every one of us has an accusing voice coming in and telling us we're less than. You're not enough. And if you don't capture that thought and take it prisoner and say, no, devil, I know who I am in Christ, not the old man. I'm a new creation now, and he loves me. And the devil could say, why? And you could say, I have no idea. I just know he does. Because <laughs> if it was based on merit, he wouldn't love me. But he still does. That's why it's by grace that I'm saved, not because I earned it, because you can't earn it, but that's how big his love is. He leaves the 99. Come find that one. Recklessly loving me. Come find me in my mess. So Paul is just trying to, it's a different letter. It's to the Philippians, but it's very similar to what he said to the Corinthians, like, be careful you don't get caught up in the world's game now and take the next fast-talking preacher that comes along and tries to give you a watered-down version because those things are not what God holds valuable. He wants you to stay in that co-pilot position. I'm not flying the plane. I'm not drinking from a cistern that's going to get empty. I'm drinking from the springs, and that means you have to be in charge, Lord. So he said, we put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have a reason for confidence in their own efforts, what? Paul said, I have even more. And then he listed it, and I didn't give it to you, but he lists all the reasons he could be boasting. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. So it doesn't mean the word was worthless because he studied the word to great benefit to us, right? Because it allowed him to translate the old into the new and the book of Romans alone. The fact that he was such a deep scholar in the Jewish scripture helped him understand what the New Testament was about. So that wasn't that his study of the word was worthless. It's the pride that he took and his rank that he achieved through his efforts. And he is just humbled by God. We need to be humbled. We just can't give place to pride. That's just the start of a really bad slide in the wrong direction, away from God. And I frankly think a lot of the unsafe people I talk to, at least, think that Christians are very prideful. 
and they think we're very judgmental and that we think we're better than unsafe people. And that's a counterfeit version of the gospel because if we should be known for anything, it should be for love and for missions work and for change in the world. Hospitals came about because of Christians. Like, you can't even know the kind of impact Christianity's had on the culture. But when they sense religion, they smell something and they're going, no, I don't want to be like that. So you need to plunge back in with the lost, not because you want to be defiled by them, but light in you belongs in the darkness where they're living. So here's this humbled guy, Paul. He could have ridden out his life as a scholar and made a good living, and he gave it all up. I mean, how many times was he beaten? And he lists that long list, 39 stripes that he took. He, he said, I'm like the off-scouring of the world for Christ. Had everything going for him. Nope. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Takes faith to believe that. Takes faith to believe that. You might get offered a promotion or job transfer that looks so great on the outside, but you better pray because the devil is so good at counterfeits and you need to hear from the Lord. And if you're not hearing from the Lord, come up for prayer at the end and say, man, I'm facing something and I don't want another Esau uh, trading my bowl of porridge that David preached on last week. Good job. I got to listen to it. I don't want a counterfeit. No Ishmael. I want the real thing. And I don't care how good it looks on the surface. That's what we do. We think, oh, how could it not be God? But you didn't pray. And that's what Paul is saying. When compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, if they're rushing you to make a decision, just say, look, I need a night to sleep on it. Those are Christians that came up with that saying. They were saying, I need to pray about it. And if the world doesn't get that, just say, I need a night to sleep on it. But really, you're going to pray and you're going to fast because just because it looks good doesn't mean it's the Lord. could be a counterfeit. All right, you guys have been great today. I'm going to finish here. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. Sorry, Siri. She said she missed that. <laughs> For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. If you want a prayer, there it is. Lord, help me become one with you. I like to say, I want to know him and make him known. It's not my saying. Other people have used it, but it's such a good little summary. What's your life about? I want to know him and I want to make him known. Get closer to him and the closer I get to him, the more other people are going to know him through me, through my life especially the lost, right? I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. So don't pull rank on other people. This is such a rich chapter. Go back and study the whole thing. I only took a couple verses. I want to know Christ. In fact, can we just stand and we'll just say this out loud together? Because this is a really good benediction kind of prayer. And we have prayer today. And I know there's fellowship upstairs because I was already up there and I saw that it's there. Um, but look, my, uh, my confession as we're going into this new decade now, you know what I mean, right? 57, 80 and the Hebrew calendar, we're coming up on that time of year where the Hebrew calendar changes. We're going out of a decade from 57, 70 to 79. Now we're going into 57, 80 to 89. And we're going out of vision in the last decade to speaking and proclaiming now with our mouth. So say it again with me. I am a portal of God's power. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? That's who I am. That's who God made me. It's right in the Bible. We read it. I'm a portal of his power. Even in my weakness, that gives him an opportunity to pour more power into me. That's not a negative. None of us can be a 10 in every category. There's going to be something that we need work with and something that we need help with. So weakness takes on a whole new dimension when God's the one filling us, right? Can you see this verse on the bottom, 10? Say it with me. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that 
one way or another, I will experience resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ and experience a mighty power that raised him from the dead. Just lift your hands for a minute, would you? Lord, we thank you that that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us today. Thank you that we can be comfortable in who you made us to be. We don't have to live up to somebody else's measurements of who they think we should be because we are your sons and daughters, and you tell us who you have made us to be. So we're not going to imitate others. We're going to be true to who you made us to be, and we're going to imitate Christ and, and godly people that you put into our lives, Lord, because we want to fulfill the calling that you placed on our lives. We want to be that portal to your power. Even when we're feeling weak, you come in with your strength and you recharge our batteries. Lord, help us turn the wheel over to you. Take our self off the throne of our heart and seat Christ on the throne of our heart. Lord, we repent right now. Let's just do it as a group and just say, Lord, I repent in any way that I have taken matters in my own hands, that I have failed to pray about important decisions, that I assumed things that I should have brought before you in prayer. Forgive me, Lord, and help me now move forward in that surrendered position. Honest before you so that you can fill me with your power, the springs of living water, not a broken, uh, broken, leaking cistern. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You said spring up a well on the inside of us. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church. Appreciate your patience hanging in there with me. Let's have the prayer ministry team come now, if you're on the prayer ministry team, because I'm just sensing some people might feel like you need more of that portal of power, and this is the time to do it. Amen? If you are not...